Hey, it's Justin from Number Crunch Nerds, and in this video, we're going to do how to get your rental property information into TurboTax. We're going to be using the TurboTax Home and Business Edition. We are going to go through all of the information that you're going to need to gather in order to get the appropriate uh, details into TurboTax. And we're also going to cover uh, depreciation on your rental property because TurboTax will accept the numbers that you put in, but if you don't fully understand the information you need to gather or what you need to put in, it is certainly possible you could be missing out on some valuable depreciation deductions that you are eligible for. So we're going to cover all of that, and we're going to get started right now. If this video helped you out, please hit that thumbs up button that you will see right below the video. All right, let's get started. We're going to be right here in the business tab, and we're going to click continue. I will choose what I want to work on for this example. Okay, the section that we're going to be working in right here is rental properties and royalties, so we're going to update that. This question, do you want to review your rental and royalty property information? Yes, that is why we are here. Okay. First question, are you a real estate professional? For most people watching this video, the answer probably will be no. If you spent more than 750 hours a year actively involved in something related to real estate, you can click this box and it will consider you a, the IRS will consider you to be a real estate professional if you uh, worked more than 750 hours a year in real estate activities or you spent more than 50% of your work-related time involved in real estate. If either of these apply to you, check the box and you will get some additional tax benefits for being a real estate professional on this rental property. For most people, the answer is going to be none of the above. Continue. Okay, the first step is going to be to click on this button and add a rental property to the list. I will let you do that on your own because that's pretty self-explanatory. Once you're done, come back here and it will appear in the list right here. You can have multiple properties listed. For this example, I put in 1234 Maple Street, and that is the property that we are going to work on. So we'll click right here, edit. Okay, the first section that we're going to work on is the property profile. And I've already typed a lot of the numbers that we're going to go through in here, so you don't have to see me actually typing them in, but we're going to go through each one, one by one, so you can understand what you have to gather. Okay, first one, uh, first section here, this is just basic address information about the property. That's pretty self-explanatory. Next, what type of property is this? For this example, we're going to do a single family home. There are other options here that you could potentially be renting. So select whatever is most appropriate. For this example, we're doing a single family residence. Continue. Okay, we are going to assume for this example that this is the first year that we rented the property. You certainly could have sold it. Uh, you could have rented part of the home. It could be a conversion. There could be a variety of other situations here, which I will cover in other videos. You can check out the description below this video, and there will be links to related content for some of these other options. For this video, we're going to assume that 2022 was the first year that you rented the property. Continue. Okay, was this property rented for the entire year? The reason that you're being asked this question is because you're only going to get tax deductions for the amount of time that the property was actually rented. You don't have you don't get it for the entire time. So, we're going to answer no because in most cases for most people it will probably be no unless you purchased it and started renting it on the first day of the year. The answer is probably going to be no. So, we're going to click this. In this example, if you look over here, here's what we're going to assume. The purchase date was the first day of February 2022. The date that it was actually available to rent is going to be the first day of March 2022. And then when it was actually rented will be the first day of April 2022. So you will have a specific situation where you'll have a date you purchased the property, a date you actually put it up on the market for rent, and then a date when it was actually rented. And the question down here that says, 
days rented at a fair rental price. So what you want to do is from the date that it actually started renting, in this case, April the 1st, 2022, you want to subtract out all the previous time. So I did that right here in this example. You can see right here in the formula bar, 365 days out of the year, minus 31 days for January, minus 28 days for February, minus 30 days for March, leaves me with 276 days that this property was actually rented. So you can do a similar calculation for your facts and circumstances. And then the fair rental days you can put in right here. Fair rental price means that you're renting it at an actual market price like you would to a third party person. If you are renting it, for example, to a family member for a discounted price, you're giving them a substantial deal, which would give them a much lower rent than uh, if they rented from a third party, you know, at a normal market price, then the IRS is not going to allow you to have tax deductions and treat this like a true rental property. You have to actually be renting it for a fair market price. We're going to assume that in this example, we're renting it for a fair market price. If you are not, you need to take that into consideration when you determine the fair rental price days. Personal use days, we're just going to assume none. We never used this property for personal use. It was strictly purchased to be rented. So that's how you calculate the fair rental days to put in right here. Continue. Okay, property ownership. For this example, we are going to assume that yes, I own 100% of this uh, property for the entire year. If you are only a partial owner, then you would only be eligible for a partial deduction. So you would select no and it would it would allocate between how much you would get versus how much other people who own the property would get. For simplicity, we're going to say that, yes, we owned 100% of this property. Continue. Okay. You indicated that you actively participate. And that's because I selected this box. Yes, I am an active participant in this. So most people watching this video, probably the answer is going to be yes, that you are an active participant in this rental property. You have to own at least 10% of the property. We already said we owned 100% in the previous question, so that applies. I made major management decisions for this property, such as approving tenants and authorizing repairs. Here is what I would suggest. If you're not sure, if you actively participate, ask yourself this question. If this property was going to be sold, would I be the person who makes the final decision whether it's going to be sold or not. If the answer is yes, then I would argue yes, you make major management decisions. Approving tenants and authorizing repairs, people can easily outsource these to a, 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 a property management company or a property manager who can take care of all of this. That doesn't mean that you're not involved in major management decisions anymore. You're involved in the management decision to hire somebody else to make decisions such as approving tenants and authorizing repairs. I would, I would just ask yourself, if the property was gonna be sold, am I the one to decide? If the answer is yes, then I would say you actively participate in major management decisions. And uh, as an active participant, you're going to be, get a better tax answer because you want to be actively participating, assuming that you are, because you will be able to take deductions uh, or losses from your real estate property against other income, such as wages, for example, that you have in your tax return. If you do not actively participate, you could be limited by what's called passive activity rules, because um, as a, if this was a passive activity, meaning you own some of the property, but you literally have nothing to do with it, and if it was going to be sold, like somebody else would actually be deciding, you would not be able to take these, this income and deduction against other, basically the deduction if you have a loss from this property against other unrelated income on your tax return. I would say for most people watching this video, chances are the answer is going to be yes, that you actively participate. So we're going to click that, continue. All right, did you pay anyone $600 or more for work related to this property? Chances are you probably did. 
if you have uh, any kind of repair or some kind of service that requires you to pay an independent contractor more than $600, for most people, it's going to be yes. And the truth is, for most people, they're not going to actually issue the 1099 uh, NEC, which you're technically supposed to do. But most people probably didn't. So we're just going to click no that you didn't actually do that. I would argue that as long as this is not huge, chances are the fact that you didn't issue these is not going to become relevant. If you have a few repairs on a property that are more than $600 and you didn't issue a form to the independent contractor, I wouldn't worry about that. So we're just gonna say, yeah, I, uh, I did pay for some work that was over 600, but I didn't issue these forms and that's what it is. We're gonna continue. All right. In this, in this section right here, you can certainly uh, import your rental property information from Quicken, QuickBooks, etc. We're just going to enter it step by step so that you can see the process if you are not at the point where you're keeping track of all this stuff using these systems. Continue. Okay, for this question, is your property in any of these designated areas? These are all kinds of like special areas, qualified disasters, Indian reservation, uh, another disaster, a Gulf opportunity zone. Chances are for most people, the answer is none. We're just going to select none and continue. All right, tell us about this property. Was this property your residence in the past? For this example, we're going to say no right here. We bought this property specifically to rent it. How did you acquire it? We bought this property. Item one, continue. All right, gather the property value information. So current property tax bill, mortgage refinance paperwork, if any, purchase paperwork, receipts for improvements and expenses. You're going to need to have all of the paperwork that you have acquired over the course of getting this property ready for rental. And we're going to start using it uh, and getting it all. Uh, I have it all, for this example. I have it all summarized here in Excel of the kinds of things we'll be looking for. Uh, you would have paperwork on that, which you can then summarize in a similar format to make sure that you've accounted for everything as we get it into the return. Continue. All right. Enter the purchase price of one, two, three, four maple. So I'm going to say that the purchase price, including land for this example right here is $500,000. So we're going to enter that here. The available date, uh, March 1st, 2022, just like I said right here, this is the date that it was actually available to be rented. It doesn't mean it was rented yet, but it was on the market to be rented. And the purchase date for this example, we're going to do February 1st, 2022. So we purchased it and then we had one month where we were getting it ready to put it on the market for rental. Continue. Okay, enter your escrow fees. So on your closing statement, you're going to find a bunch of fees. I'm going to say that the escrow fees are $6,000 and I've put $1,000 in each one of these categories just so you can see how all this stuff gets into the return. You may have some of these, you may not have all of them, whatever you do have, just enter them here appropriately. Most of this information can be found on the closing statement for the property. And there may be some other documents depending on your facts and circumstances. All this information is for prior to you actually renting it. This is, uh, this is part of the purchase. And all of these costs are going to become part of the property that you depreciate. These are not expensed separately. You will see that in a moment. So we're going to have $6,000 of escrow fees in this example. Continue. All right. Any seller paid points? So uh, this is not common. And if there are seller paid points, they will be on your uh, either your closing statement or your mortgage paperwork from the lender. Points paid by the seller are actually going to reduce the amount of uh, the value of your property that's ultimately going to be depreciated. In this case, on Excel, you can see I put here as a negative number. In uh, TurboTax, you just enter it as a positive number and the system will, will turn it into a negative number later. So uh, this may not be common, but if you have it, put the points in right here. Continue. Okay, any 
property improvements made. So these are costs uh, that occurred after the purchase date, but probably prior to the date that it was available to be rented. In this case, I'm gonna say that we spent $50,000 on remodeling. If you did any remodeling, I want you to remember this section right here, because I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it later and give you an argument as to why perhaps you should put your remodeling costs somewhere else as a second, uh, as a separate asset. But there is a there is an opportunity to put them in here, and I'll show you why later why you might consider uh, putting them somewhere else. Room additions, special tax assessments, which uh, could be sidewalks, sewer connections, other things that um, that may apply to your situation. You can enter all of that in here. You will see that it's going to add to the total. So right here, here's the remodeling of fifty thousand. It will add to the total. That's ultimately going to be the value of your rental property that uh, will be depreciated. Continue. All right, again, other, other payments, easements, energy credits, energy subsidiaries. I'm going to just put something in so you can see how it flows into the return. Let's say we got an energy credit of $2,500. That's going to be end up being a negative number, which reduces your uh, the total cost or basis in this property to be depreciated. So I put it here as negative. In the system, you'll just enter it as a positive number if you got any energy credits or any of these other items on this property. Continue. Okay, and other increases and decreases to your property basis. Again, property basis just means the total amount, starting with the purchase price and adding and subtracting all of these other adjustments that we just went through, to arrive at a number that's ultimately going to be used to depreciate this rental property every year that you own it. I threw in another increase just so we can see how it ends up in the total. Some possibilities include legal fees paid to defend the title, some other items. If you have any of this stuff or anything that might decrease the, the basis First time home buyers credit, District of Columbia. There, there's most people, the answer is probably going to be no, and these will probably be blank. But I threw in $3,000 of an increase just so you can see right here how it's going to impact the total. Continue. Okay, this is a very important section right here that I want to spend some time on because this is the part where you might be missing out on some valuable tax deductions without really realizing it. So. This section is asking you to enter property tax values. Use the values listed on your property tax bill to find this information. But it also says your property tax bill may not show reliable assessed values. If you have recently purchased a newly built house or made improvements to the property, if your assessed values don't reflect the full value of the improvements to your property, you could still use uh, the assessed land value. However, you should enter the value of the improvements based on your cost, et cetera, et cetera. Let me explain in English what this is asking. The IRS requires you to take this cost, which we're going to calculate right here, starting with the purchase price and adding all of these things that we just went through. In this case, the total is 552,500. It's going to require you to take this number and allocate it between land and basically everything else, okay? The building, improvements, structures. The reason it wants you to do that is because land is not a depreciable asset. So what it's asking you to do is go to your property tax bill and find what the value of the land is versus what the value of everything else on the property is. And it's going to use these amounts to make an allocation of this number between land and everything else. So if we look down here, here is uh, the land value that I'm assuming ba based on an assumed property tax bill. Let's say the land, the fair value is 100,000 based on your property tax bill. That, I shouldn't say fair value. The assessed land value on your property tax bill is shown as 100000 And let's say 
that the assessed value of everything else is 325,000, which are the numbers that I've put in right here. You realize that the total assessed value on a property tax bill or a property tax statement is not necessarily going to reflect the fair market value uh, of that you purchased it for or what it could be sold for in the market. Uh, the numbers used by the state to assess these values are often different. But when you use them right here, here's what happens. 24% of the total assessed value ends up in land. And 76% of the total assessed value ends up in everything else. And then so what it does is it takes this number and it multiplies it by 24% to give you the amount that's allocated to land which is 130. This number, in this example, you will never get the depreciate. You'll never get the expense for that. This number is what you will get the expense for. This is 76% of the total amount, 552,500. And you're gonna see that if we go here to continue, you're gonna see that on the next page. It says, your rental property at 1234 Maple Street will be depreciated by 422,500 during the next 27 and a half years. 27 and a half years is just the, uh, that's the, the amount that you get on rental properties under current, uh, under current law with the IRS, under current tax law. So here's the 42, uh, 422,500. It is 76% of that total amount the cost, 500, plus all these other adjustments that we just went through, that's the amount you'll get to depreciate. This amount is, is lost, essentially. You don't actually get to depreciate it. And the re, and, and how it was allocated was based off of um, an assessed property tax bill. That's why they're asking you, let's go back right here. That's why they're asking you for these numbers. These numbers are being used to determine how much of this you will ultimately get to depreciate. Now I'm going to go through some possible alternatives to, like I said at the beginning, TurboTax will accept these numbers. These are numbers that you have pulled off a property tax statement. TurboTax is not going to say, well, maybe, you know, maybe these are the best values to give you the best deduction. It's just going to accept these. So I'm going to give you some alternatives in a minute. Let's keep going here. See what comes up next. Okay. So that is the end of um, that is the end of the property profile section. And as you can see down here, in assets and depreciation. Right now, this is the depreciation deduction that we're getting: twelve thousand one hundred and sixty-three dollars. And the way that's calculated is the depreciable basis, which is the four twenty-two five hundred, which is what I told you right here. Seventy-six percent of this total amount is what's being used. This is a number from the IRS depreciation table from those uh, that 27 and a half years. I can show you where to get this number. This multiplied by that is the 12163. That is what the system is doing to determine this depreciation number on this asset. And if we go into update here, and let's just go yes, we're going to go directly to our asset summary. Uh, this is the residential property that was placed in service on three. 1 2022. By the way, just so you're clear, once it's available for rent, you can start taking depreciation on it. It doesn't actually have to be rented yet. Um, once it's rented, that's when other expenses will come into play. For example, repairs and things that, um, that occur after this date. If those items are under a certain amount, they can just be expensed. They don't have to be depreciated over time. Uh, but once it's available for rent, that's when the depreciation begins. And that's how we get this number right here. So if we take a quick look at that, just so you can see um, what's happening. Here's the residential property. Here is the cost, the amount you paid for it, plus freight, installation, et cetera, et cetera, 500. Here it is. It's the 500 we paid plus all those other things we just went through. That's the 552, 500 and 130,000 cost of the land. That's an allocated amount based on 
the property tax bill. So let's get into a quick alternative on what you might consider related to this. All right, let's go back and look at some alternatives here for this section where we entered the property tax values. If you remember earlier, we put in 100,000 for the land value, 325,000 was the value of everything else. These were the assessed values off the property tax statement from the state. But I told you that it's possible these are not the best numbers for you to be using. And there's no requirement that it has to come off of the assessed value from the property tax statement from the state. Every state assesses property tax values in a different way. What they show on the statement varies. It, there's no consistency across states. So there's no requirement it has to come from this. It could come from your uh, settlement, your purchase settlement statement. It could come from the statement for your mortgage, uh, from your lender. There's a lot of places where you could find what the potential land value versus the value of everything else is, what the allocation is. One possibility that I want you to consider is here, here is the, here's the information from before. There was the 552,500. That was the total amount of all these items that we added up. Purchase price plus escrow fees and all this other stuff. That's how we got 552,500. That's this number. Here is the example property tax statement where we, where we use these numbers and we allocated 24% of the total amount to land. This 130, you will never get that. You will never get to deduct this amount. This is gone, essentially. It's the total amount allocated to land. Land is not a depreciable asset. Everything else, 76% in this example, went to the improved value of the structure, which is depreciable. And so as we saw a few minutes ago, this is the number that you're actually getting to deduct over time. This is how much you will get to uh, recover over the life of this rental property, this amount you will lose. But what is another alternative you might consider? You could consider calling your real estate agent and getting a CMA or a competitive market analysis. And the simple question is, what is the average price of similar sized vacant lots in my area? Let's say the agent runs that analysis for you and it comes back at 75,000. Well, if the average price of vacant lots in your area is 75,000 and your total purchase price was 552,500, then the amount that I could allocate to the improved value this should actually say improved value right here, not total purchase price. This is the total purchase price right here, 552500 If this is the total and this is the amount from similar sized vacant lots in my area, then this is the amount that I'm going to allocate to my improved value, meaning everything that is not land. If I do it this way, then the land as the as a percentage of the total is only 14% and everything else as a percentage of the total is 86% meaning that ultimately the allocation of this to land is is now only 75,000 and the allocation of everything else is 477,500 so what this means is if you set up your allocation like this, for example, then over the life of this rental property, you would only lose 75,000 in deduction as opposed to 130,000 of deduction, a big difference. And as I said, there's no requirement that it has to come off the property statement, the, the values of these. That's just one possibility. There are others, for example, doing this. It certainly cannot hurt you to have your agent run this and see what the value of vacant lots is. And if the value is lower than on the property tax statement, or if you don't have a property tax statement yet because you just purchased the uh, the property you know, not that long ago, you may need an alternative which could provide you with a much uh, more beneficial answer over time because you will get to depreciate all of this 477 500 as opposed to 422 500 so i recommend that 
you do that. All right, and the last thing that we're going to check is how you can make sure that this 12,163, which is the amount of depreciation that we're currently getting, right here is the 12,163. We are going to make sure that that is showing up correctly. And to check that, just go up here to Forms View. And we're going to go to Schedule E, which is right here, Schedule E, page one. And you can see right down here, here is the depreciation expense, 12163 And since that's the only thing that we have entered so far for this rental property, we haven't entered in any rents received or anything like that, this becomes a loss right here, 12163 And that loss, because you are an active participant in this, that loss is being carried up here, I believe, to Schedule 1. Form 1040 Schedule 1, which is your personal tax return, right here. Re, uh, rental real estate, 12163 of a loss, which is going against other income that you may have in your return because you are actively participating in this property. That is how you can make sure that it's showing up correctly on line 5 here, Schedule 1. And before we conclude this video, there is one more thing I said I would show you. Right here, when we were calculating the depreciation of 12163 in our work paper in Excel, I told you that this number right here came from the IRS depreciation tables for 27.5 year uh, rental real estate property. And where you can get that is right here, publication 527. You can just Google IRS publication 527. Go down here, this is on page 11, and right down here, residential rental property, 27.5 year, and you will see a table right here for year number one, which is the first year uh, which we've been doing in this example. You just pick the month right here. In this case, we picked uh, March was when it was available to be rented, 2879, and that is you know, percentage. So 0 0.02879 is what I entered right here, and that calculates the 12,163, which is what TurboTax is calculating for your depreciation deduction on this property. So that is how you can find the amount uh, that you need to calculate this in your work paper if you desire to do so. That's going to conclude this video. If this video helped you out, please help the channel by hitting that thumbs up button below the video, and we will see you in the next video.